Greetings and welcome to today's webinar, a part of Schulich School's webinar series on shaping the post-pandemic world. My name is Preet Aulak and I'm the Associate Dean of Research at Schulich. I'll be hosting the webinar and moderating the Q&A session. No introduction can do justice in stating Professor Belk's contribution over an illustrious career. Thus, I will not attempt it. Other than to say that Professor Belk is a legend who redefined the field of marketing through his research, especially the way we understand consumers and consumer behavior. We are very fortunate to have him today, where he'll be talking about consumers and COVID-19. Over to you, Russ. Thank you, Preet. Well, welcome everyone. And uh, I think this is gonna be the first session out of six that uh, we've had so far. That's gonna be about the consumer side rather than the business side. In the past, we've had some presentations on CSR corporate responsibility, on supply chain, on wage subsidy, on leadership and strategy, but this will be the first one focused on the consumer side. Uh, we have a bunch more of exciting presentations uh, coming up in the future weeks, and we'll get back to the consumer in at least one or two of those, uh, but obviously when we talk about the consumer, we're also talking about implications for business. But let's just begin, I'll show you uh, basically what we're going to be covering today. We'll begin with an exercise and uh, it's thinking about how consumption, uh, your consumption that is, has been influenced by COVID-19. Uh, so that's something to think about and we'll field some answers to that question in a minute. I'll then go to some results from a poll of Schulich consumer behavior professors and uh, PhD students, uh, sort of our brain trust in consumer behavior. but they're not necessarily typical of uh, the world or typical consumers, so I'll, I'll issue some cautions after we look at those results. Then I want to bring you back in again with three short forecast questions and see what you would forecast uh, for the future and uh, turn then to some evidences. Uh, evidences first from online searches that people are doing related to COVID-19 and consumption. Evidences from elsewhere in the world, places like China have peaked and begun to recover more quickly. What are they doing in terms of post-COVID consumption and a few other cultures as well? And then also evidences from past crises. Everyone brings up the, the flu epidemic of 1918, but uh, there's others that I think we can learn from as well, although they're all different in their own ways. I think I had the last two of these in, in reverse. Uh, then I'd like to go to relevant consumer behavior concepts so we can sort of get a conceptual understanding of what's going on here. And with some possible big changes. This changes everything. I think that was initially a phrase with the iPhone introduction. And it was also a phrase that was used in the iPhone 4 introduction. This changes everything again. And it was also the title of a book by uh, Naomi Klein uh, talking about uh, climate change uh, and what we do about it. And then we'll end up with that, that Q&A as Preet mentioned. So let's begin with this exercise. What do you miss most uh, due to COVID-19? And if you go to www.minty.com and enter the code 174319, you should be able to give some answers uh, to that question and we'll see what the results are. Well, let's go back. I think that was very interesting. One thing that I noticed was that there weren't a lot of things that were here. There were a number of relationships, people. There were also some activities, uh, going out to restaurants, for example. One that came up very uh, early on my screen was my nephew. And I'm wondering if that's someone who's actually died uh, from COVID-19. And it sort of puts things in perspective. We're talking about consumption and what people really miss, it seems, is relationships with people. So I think that helps us look at consumption, but realize it may not always be the most important thing. So I'd mentioned that we'll be looking at first some results from a poll of our consumer behavior people and look at such things as in the short run, as short term, as, as re restrictions are lifted, what will we do or buy less than in 2019? What will we consume more than we did in 2019? And what things may never bounce back, take longer to resume or never uh, resume at all? And then as we'll get onto the presentation, later in the presentation, we'll look at what are the big changes that are coming. So let's begin. I told the consumer behavior uh, professors and PhD students, make these assumptions. Assume that there's no vaccine for at least a year, but cases in Canada are down substantially. 
assume a gradual reopening of schools, businesses, and government sometime in the late summer. And assume that social distancing is still recommended, but face masks and gloves uh, are optional. And then I had them do two things, go through a list of 20 consumption areas, estimate which things they think would show up less in our consumption patterns, and which ones we might actually do more. And so just look at uh, the results of those separately. These are the things that both in the short term and long term, people expected we're going to be doing more of. So more online buying, more working from home. Uh, the online buying uh, hurts especially small retailers, as we'll see. Working from home has some other sorts of implications that I, I want to consider later on as well. We'll also be doing more saving. Now, presumably that's to build our savings back up if, if we've used it uh, in the interim, uh, and also perhaps to recoup the losses that we might have taken on our retirement investments. And the last thing that, according to this group of people, we'll be doing more of it short term and long term is buying more furniture and home decor. I guess when we stay home more, we look around more carefully and uh, say, well, that, that could probably be nicer. So those are the things that we're going to be doing more of, according to this panel. These are the things people said we're going to be doing less of. Travel outside of North America, and that's presumably by uh, airplane or, or ship, uh, which is probably worse, but uh, the airlines are having to do things like remove middle seats and uh, require that people wear masks and so forth. Less going to movies. Now, when we go to movies, we're going to a movie theater where we're uh, in a crowd of other people, and that may not be the safest environment. Also, maybe we've learned to subscribe to Netflix and uh, Disney and uh, Apple and uh, uh, some others. And in doing that, uh, we've learned we can watch uh, movies pretty comfortably in our own home. We'll be doing less commuting, according to this panel, and that's partly tied into working more at home. Less arena sports and fewer concerts. Actually, in Taiwan, professional baseball has started back up, but instead of having fans in the stands, they have these cardboard cutouts uh, of fans, I guess, to inspire the team. But they're not going to have the yelling, uh, of course, that they would with real fans. And finally, less car buying. And I think this also has to do with working more at home, something that we've learned we can do and businesses can survive. And obviously some professions can't do that, but if you're in a white collar profession, uh, a lot of us can stay home more. And so we need to buy a car less. Finally, there were some things that uh, people saw going down in the short term, but bouncing back up in the long term. That is we could do less of them in the short term but more of them than 2019 in the long term. So North American travel, whether by uh, car or by plane, luxuries. And there may be a couple of reasons for that. When we have less money, we're less apt to buy luxuries. But if times are bad, we don't like to show off and rub it in other people's faces that may not have survived uh, the COVID crisis quite so comfortably as we have. Less eating out, and again, that's proximity to other people, but the bounce back may have to do uh, with being able to afford it again and it becoming safer. The same for bars and clubs. And subways and trams, again, that's a confined space, but people do see that getting back to normal. University education. I thought this would be plus plus in, in both the short term and long term because usually when people have difficulty finding a job, or getting back to uh, a job, they, they go back to university for uh, higher degrees so that they're more qualified. But perhaps because of both the online learning, which may be a, a little less congenial, and because they can afford it less, uh, it, it's gonna be something that bounces back in the long term. Hair care bouncing back, Christmas spending bouncing back. I also thought that would be big in 2020, but apparently people are still seeing that as being more reserved. Gym and yoga, that's outside the home. Real estate, and real estate is kind of interesting, but uh, it's something that I'll come back to as well. And I should have mentioned these are in descending order. And so of the things that will bounce back, clothes are uh, one of the uh, people are least positive about it in the long term. But nevertheless, uh, it's nice to buy new clothes, even if we're going into the office less. These are the cautions. Your mileage may vary. And these are the things that uh, I think can affect that. Uh, just to pick out an example, uh, are you a woman? Uh, women tend to be more frontline workers. They tend to be hit harder uh, by the uh, layoffs that may have taken place. 
uh, and so that's a factor. Uh, do you own a small or medium-sized business? Uh, some polls suggest that as many as 30% uh, to a third of businesses may not come back at all, uh, close permanently. And so all of these factors um, are words of caution in interpreting those results. But um, let's take another poll and then we'll go on and look at some other evidences besides uh, what, what we think. I'd like you to think about three questions and you can answer them uh, at the bottom uh, with yes or right or no or wrong. And the first one is in 2021, things will more or less be back to normal. The second one, things will never be back to normal. Yes or no. And the third one, I know someone who has or had COVID-19. So let's see what we get for results here. <laughs> Interesting, I don't think these can both be true. 59% say things will be back to normal in 2021 and 56% say they will never be back to normal. But I think it's very interesting, a little less than half, fewer than half, uh, know someone who has now or had in the past COVID-19. So it's getting pretty close to home. I didn't ask how many of you may have had COVID-19, but uh, presumably something less than that 45%. Okay, very interesting. Let's go on then. These are some of the online indicators. This is a little bit more anecdotal. I'll look a little bit more systematically in a minute. But Zoom shares, Netflix shares, Amazon shares all way up. Google searches for Netflix uh, way up since January. Uh, searches for Jim and Lululemon, Jim Clothing, uh, up uh, substantially. Presumably some of this is to be able to get uh, tips on exercising at home or follow along videos but it's something that we'll, we'll be doing more of in the future outside the home. Searches for buying a car down 39%, uh, again, like the results that we saw from the panel, uh, something that uh, is less important today. And Metro.ca is a Toronto area, actually it's uh, Quebec and Ontario. Their visits were up 83%. And interestingly, this is a supermarket that uh, does delivery. And so I think that may have something to do with the pattern here. But let's look at some others. Google publishes each day uh, coronavirus search trends. And before we look at their results, I put in uh, some searches and looked at the period uh, since uh, January, the end of January until uh, last week. You can see that Amazon, Netflix, and Zoom have all shot up uh, since uh, early March. Uh, on the other hand, searches for the NBA and searches for restaurants have gone down substantially. There was a peak in searching for NBA, and that's probably when the COVID-19 case in a game between uh, Toronto Raptors and Utah Jazz took place. Uh, but since the NBA season enter, uh, ended, uh, that's gone down substantially. And restaurants are understandable as well. In this one, we might look at the peaks here. Searches for toilet paper and uh, sanitizer peaked in early March when presumably there were rumors that uh, those things were going to be in short supply and people were hoarding them. Searches for uh, COVID-19 uh, then went up and face masks uh, were something that uh, were rumored to be in short supply. And before that, COVID-19 peak. So these are all things that uh, we can see when the particular top interest in those occurred. These are just daily uh, reports from um, Google. And these are the Google searches. We could do it for all internet searches if uh, we wanted. The one for Goodell Basement, Roger Goodell is the National Football League commissioner and the uh, draft of uh, future players took place last week and he did it in his basement. Uh, there were television cameras down there. His, his man cave would make any of us envious, but uh, that, that's why the search for Goodell Basement. Uh, the others were more uh, COVID-19 related as, as we can see. We could also look, as I said, for evidences in other countries uh, bouncing back from COVID-19. In China, car sales have jumped up, contrary to what we were talking about here as expect expectations, and driving is up, uh, perhaps a little bit more understandably as well. I, I think maybe to interpret that, fewer people in China own cars, uh, getting out of the subways and buses into uh, cars, uh, private space, maybe what's driving that. China's food and beverages rebounded, uh, or are rebounding, uh, but not jewelry and furniture, more luxury purchases, uh, not so much showing off quite yet. 
jump down to uh, the UK is calling for spending less on road repairs and rail projects. And that's partly because, uh, or largely because, they're also uh, intending to work more from home. And so if there's less traffic on the roads, let's put that money into something else other than roads repair and, and rail projects, uh, something like green energy, for example. Last week, also, Australians started downloading an app on their smartphones to allow tracking them. And the reason for that is that uh, they can then use that app to find out where there are people that are COVID positive and uh, stay away from them in their immediate vicinity. So far on the first day, 2.5 million people downloaded that app. There's 25 million people in all of Australia, so they're about one-tenth on the first day. They figured they need about 40 uh, million people uh, to, to make it a viable uh, sort of project. And so there's a ways to go before they get there, but at that rate, uh, it, it should happen. China is able to track people, and they did this even starting in Wuhan because of the, the social index scores that they have there. And so before COVID-19, you could get a high social index score by posting good things online by having good friends, uh, by having those friends post uh, good things online uh, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, you could get a negative score for not paying your bills or your taxes on time, jaywalking, uh, stopping in crosswalks and, and so forth. So they used that app to follow people who were COVID-19 positive, also using CCTV cameras uh, around the country. Now, Google and Apple are teaming up to do something like that in order to uh, do tracking uh, in the US. And so this may be uh, something of the future, although in Australia, the citizens were guaranteed that the, uh, the information uh, on where they were uh, would only be used uh, and would not be shared uh, with anyone else, only be used for COVID-19 tracking. So patterns elsewhere tell us something. We could also look at evidence from prior crises. And these are some that I would list. Uh, it's not exhaustive. Uh, we could include things like the Asian economic collapse of 1986, the Vietnam War, post-colonialism, fall of the Berlin Wall, the European Union, and so forth. But these are some of the major ones. And uh, no time to go over these all in detail, but maybe just to give a couple of examples uh, of what we learned from, from each of them. Before World War I, you didn't need a passport uh, in most places. And uh, there was large-scale migration. It was fairly open. Global trade was almost at the level that it was uh, before COVID-19 uh, today. And it was a time where there was a lot of technology, uh, steamships to go across the ocean. There was uh, the telegraph, uh, which uh, was called the Victorian internet, uh, allowed people to connect with each other at great distances. And then eventually the telephone as well. But after World War I, things changed. And uh, for example, uh, the income tax went up from 7% in the U.S. in 1915 to 77% in 1918. Uh, and eventually 90% uh, in 1944, and subsequently uh, came down to about 36% where it is, uh, is today. Spanish flu has received uh, a lot of press uh, among things that people paid attention to. You were not allowed to take the elevator or the lift in your apartment building if you had to go up fewer than uh, six or fewer floors. And so this was a confined space where uh, Spanish flu could spread. And so there was uh, a regulation about that which sometimes people broke. There were quarantines, there were masks, a lot of things similar today. The Great Depression uh, lasted from 1929 to 1939, lots that we could talk about there. You can see the movie theater here and uh, going to the movies was uh, a very popular thing. It was estimated that between 60 and 80 million people went to the theater at least once a week and you got really good value for your money. You'd see a, a cartoon, a newsreel, a, a B feature movie, and then the main uh, attraction. So that lasted about four hours. Uh, today, uh, things are different, of course. Uh, and As we just saw, people don't want to go to movie theaters so much uh, any longer and they can watch uh, movies of their choice uh, easily uh, at home. Also during the Great Depression, marriages and births went down as is happening right now with uh, COVID-19. Suicides went up, unfortunately. 
prices went down, but that also meant farmers were less well off. Prohibition was in full force until 1932 when it was rescinded. Higher education took a beating. Uh, unaffordable Monopoly and Sorry were the top board games that were played at home. And films uh, that I started out mentioning were largely escapist fare, uh, oftentimes a Cinderella motif where the, the poor young girl marries a rich man and lives happily ever after. But there were also critical comedies, things like the Marx Brothers Duck Soup, which made fun of government and business and just about everyone in authority. As the Depression went on and as Hoover was uh, replaced, the, the atmosphere was, was a bit more positive. Uh, at least the, the critical uh, films went, went down in popularity or uh, uh, replaced by you know, uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dancing, uh, dancing away. Before 9-11, we had World War II, uh, and in World War II, uh, some interesting consumer behavior things. Uh, the, the women couldn't buy nylon stockings because the nylon was used for parachutes in the war, and so they, they colored uh, their legs brown and put a stripe down the back. Nylon stockings at the time, rather than being seamless, had a, a seam down uh, the center. They also uh, bought little things like lipstick, uh, which was uh, called a, a, a little luxury, something that could cheer you up. And it didn't cost much, uh, it cost a bit more today. But those were some of the effects in World War II. And actually, I guess on, on the lipstick thing, uh, when the, the bergen Belsen concentration camp was liberated by the British at the end of World War II, uh, the Red Cross was there, and the British commander couldn't figure out why the Red Cross had bought, brought uh, lipstick. But people were desperate to get this lipstick, and the women, that is, and clutching it in their hands even as they were dying. Uh, it was something that gave them hope. It gave them back a sense of being a woman again, being a, a human being again. Uh, and, and so consumption was important, and it was important in uh, morale as well. And in the movies that people were going to at the time uh, of World War II, there were a lot of propaganda films uh, disguised as newsreels, talking about how our brave boys overseas were winning the war uh, and so forth, in order to keep spirits up. 9-11, I think many of you have uh, lived through. One of the first things that both President uh, George W. Uh, Bush and, and uh, Tony Blair uh, said the day after planes crashed into the Twin Trade Towers was, go out and shop, show them that we're not beaten down, uh, strike your vote by voting with your, your dollars. Well, it, it took a while to come back. And of course, uh, airlines and air travel uh, changed completely. Uh, we began to have air marshals, uh, security, long lines, uh, and, and so forth, the things that uh, we're, we're used to today. Uh, it was also a time of uh, racism. Uh, anyone that looked even uh, vaguely Muslim, uh, including some Indians uh, that had on turbans for Sikhs, for example, were uh, despised. The same was true with Asians in the 2003 SARS uh, epidemic. That also resulted in some post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome. Hong Kong was hit more heavily with uh, the SARS epidemic uh, than uh, Canada, where I am. Uh, but Toronto was also hit and uh, restaurant patronage at Chinese restaurants went down. I, I was here at the time, I, I could remember. So 2008 was uh, the mortgage meltdown. And uh, one of the things that happened uh, was that uh, millennials uh, born uh, roughly between 1981 and 1986, I guess that's not rough, it's fairly precise, were the ones that lost their homes more than anyone. And they were just bouncing back from 9-11, which hit them uh, heavily in the job market when the mortgage meltdown uh, caused many of them to, to lose their home. Many people that lost their homes, interestingly, put their furniture and possessions in storage. And now when some of them are getting back into uh, homes again, uh, they're finding they didn't really need those things that they put in storage. They were more a source of psychological uh, security rather than actual security. And that brings us to today and, and COVID-19. And we've been talking about uh, the, the things that we're doing to change our consumption patterns. There's also sort of a sense of exerting a false sense or an illusionary sense of control. And hoarding is one way to do that. It's doing something. We feel that we're doing something, even though we feel fairly power, powerless. Uh, gun sales, unfortunately, increased uh, as well. Uh, 
uh, for a sense of security, perhaps. And so did compulsive news watching and watching the statistics, on, uh, which only makes us more paranoid and uh, a more unrealistic uh, view of, of the world. Let's go on and consider uh, a few more things. Some of the relevant consumer behavior concepts, we haven't looked so much uh, at concepts, uh, habits and inertia. While we're no longer doing a daily commute or a five day uh, a week uh, commute, that stopped us from um, you know, stopping and picking up a few groceries. Uh, it stopped us from stopping for coffee, going out to eat and so forth. So habits uh, are hard to overcome. A liminality is, uh, liminal is betwixt and between, and we sort of feel in that liminal state now. We expect something dramatic is going to happen uh, at the end, and I'll look at some big implications in a minute. Home as haven has uh, been driven home as uh, it's a place where we're always uh, welcome and always feel comfortable, and comfort is important here, comfort foods among other things. Social comparison, another concept. Uh, we compare ourselves to others. How does our sacrifice compare to theirs? Some people are getting a sense of agoraphobia. Uh, they've stayed home so much they, they fear going out in the marketplace, perhaps unrealistically. Need hierarchies. I think most of you are familiar with uh, Maslow's need hierarchy. What gets uh, sacrificed first? Presumably the luxuries before the necessities, but uh, we'll, we'll see in a slide or two hints uh, that that's not always the case. Consumer sentiments, that's something that we'll see in a slide or two uh, a, as well, but uh, an index of how we feel about the future. And it's a pretty good predictor of what's gonna be happening in the future and how much consumers are gonna be spending or going to be uh, willing to spend in the future. Some people have suggested that we should emphasize rather than gross domestic product, gross domestic happiness. Um, and uh, Bhutan was the nation uh, in, in the Himalayas that first did that. Uh, other countries are considering it now as well. But people like uh, Emita Etzioni have suggested that really is not adequate because we need to have a sense of consumer citizens as well and a sense of not only doing for ourselves and making ourselves happy but making others happy as well. We might talk about two types of consumer goods and the ones on the left survival products uh, are pretty close to being necessities at least necessities during the uh, COVID-19 virus whereas the things on the right uh, alcohol entertainment uh, the lipstick effect as I mentioned are things that we need for our sanity. And this is sort of jumping the queue in Maslow's need hierarchy. We shouldn't be emphasizing these higher order needs until we satisfy the lower order needs, but we need these sanity uh, products as well. I mentioned the consumer sentiment index. It's gone down to 68.9%. And let's just have a look at that. These are the latest results. And the 71.8 actually for April is the lowest it's ever been since the University of Michigan started measuring consumer sentiments in 1946. So consumers right now are not very optimistic about their spending and the future. I mentioned big changes, and this is what I'd like to emphasize in, uh, in ending, that things like maybe the US will finally get government health care system like the rest of the advanced industrial world. Maybe we'll have some big lifestyle changes. I, I mentioned uh, working more from the home, uh, but perhaps uh, emphasizing a less materialistic lifestyle as well. This is something that I've studied a bit. And times of major change are times of major change in materialism, positive or negative. Changes in housing patterns. I think one of the things I mentioned, the millennials, who right now have uh, made it a trend to move back into the inner city, pay high rental for small spaces, one of the things that facing those four walls for the last couple of months uh, may be driving them crazy is not having a lot of space. And uh, one of the things that, especially they're, they're pushing 40 almost uh, at the upper end, uh, they may be beginning to have families, have children, and think about more space and moving out to the suburbs. In addition to the uh, working from home, freeing up a lot of office space, and some of that office space will be converted into uh, housing. And so there may be uh, lower prices bringing some people into the city, but a different socioeconomic class, uh, with more people moving out of the city. I think we may be able to get serious about pollution and global warming, and I'll show you some slides on that uh, in a moment. We may be able to do some uh, universal basic income, and the wage subsidies that we have right now, uh, at least in Canada, but we have similar programs elsewhere, are something close to uh, that universal basic income, which everyone would get, regardless of need. 
And finally, reducing income inequality. But let me just show you a couple of slides and end with a quote from Philip Kotler. If we look at pollution, this is uh, New Delhi, India. Uh, you can see the pollution on the left and how it's cleared up on the right. Now, part of that is seasonal as well, but it really has cleared up. You can see the pattern uh, from global satellites. Uh, this is India, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, a bit of Pakistan. China, the same. Europe, the same. And North America, we can see a similar pattern as well. Well, I said I would end with a quote from Philip Kotler. Uh, many of you know him as the father of modern marketing. He's uh, been known as uh, having the leading selling uh, textbook in the area. And uh, it's something that uh, is um, surprising to hear from him. He said, and uh, this is the, the website where you can pick this up and the full uh, white paper that he delivered that capitalism remains the best engine for efficient economic growth. It also can be the best engine for equitable economic growth. It doesn't change to socialism when we raise taxes on the rich. We have uh, given up the false economic doctrine that the poor will win when the rich get richer. This is the rising tide raises all boats. Um, actually, the rich will get richer by leaving more money in the hands of the working class families to spend. Uh, this was uh, sort of uh, Ford's uh, early um, decision to pay the workers a high wage, uh, higher than the industry standards, so that they could spend more, and it worked. And Kotler goes on, it's a time to rethink and rewire capitalism and transform it into a more equitable form based on democracy and social justice. Uh, either we will learn to share, uh, more like Scandinavian countries, or we will become a banana republic. We're all in this together. And you can look at people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett who say, tax the rich. Uh, we have too much money. It's not equitable. Uh, and, and so these are people that have also gotten behind uh, something similar. We, we see obscene things like CEOs being paid as much as 1,100 times the average wage of their workers. So that means if a worker were getting 50,000, that the, the CEO is getting something like 55 million uh, in compensation at that same time, that same year. Well, let's now turn to uh, questions. I'm going to do one for Andrea Tang. When you refer to short term and long term, how much time is this referring to? Is there a specific number of months after a crisis that we see long term consumption, especially in real estate, university education, tourism bouncing back based on historical events? Well, that's a good point. I think uh, what's going to be long term uh, and what's going to be short term is going to differ uh, across those industries. So we may be able to, able to uh, get back to some things uh, fairly quickly, uh, getting hair care, getting uh, your nails done, uh, something of that sort, because uh, it seems fairly urgent and it's something that uh, is inexpensive. Real estate, uh, there's probably some pent up demand uh, that will uh, temporarily affect uh, the market. Uh, but I think these long term trends like the millennials and uh, like freeing up space in office buildings with more people working from home are going to shake that market up substantially as well. And so prices may go down in the inner city and they may go up uh, in the suburbs. Uh, and so that's something to, to wait and see as well. Actually, when, when we uh, probed people. Um, I, I didn't specify exactly what was short term and long term. I said compare it to 2019. And so I think people were looking at uh, 2020, perhaps 2021, and uh, things beyond that being long term. Uh, but it's a good question because it's a, that short term is going to differ across industries. A question for Ash, from Ashwin Joshi who asks, how do we ensure that physical distancing will not result in social distancing? The, I think one of the things that we've done socially is uh, keep more in touch with people because uh, they're just a Facebook post or a tweet or uh, an email uh, away. And so in a sense, I think that has allowed us to be social at a distance. Now, obviously being social at a distance is not the same as face-to-face. -face. I remember a cartoon where there was a nearly empty funeral partner, parlor with maybe six people viewing a coffin and one of them is saying to the other, I thought there'd be more than people, uh, more people than this. He had more than a thousand Facebook friends. Uh, obviously our Facebook friends are not the same as uh, our, our real life friends. 
I think people are anxious to get back out. Uh, Sweden is one of the countries that uh, didn't do away uh, with being able to go out and, and go to bars and restaurants, but at the same time tried to keep some uh, social distance. Uh, I've, I've lived in Sweden for a while and just after uh, the snow begins to melt, everyone is outside at the outdoor cafes. Uh, we think as people did in uh, 2018 uh, with the uh, Asian flu epidemic, that having fresh air uh, is, is going to help keep us safer. That's not really the case, although confined spaces do uh, keep the germs into a somewhat greater degree. So I think we'll begin to see, uh, especially if this happens uh, in the summer, that we can go out again, uh, people at outdoor cafes before we see them inside uh, at restaurants. Beaches, you may have heard California opened the beaches for the weekend and has now closed them again because people were getting too close. People were too close at spring break in the, the Florida beaches, uh, Daytona and elsewhere. And so I think it's going to be a sort of cat and mouse game, how much uh, intimacy we can have. I think that will build back uh, as we become more confident as uh, the rates of uh, COVID and the death rates from COVID uh, go down. From Larry uh, Watmore and Deborah as a way to go. So I'm going to uh, state the one from Deborah. Do you believe that the tendency of concentrating population in big cities will be reversed? Working from home and higher and the higher risk of contagion in big cities will drive people away. Well, I think there's some truth in that. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of benefits from living in the city. Things are interesting. Things are happening uh, in the city. We see uh, people, uh, the, the, the rush of other people before COVID-19, of course, uh, is exciting and uh, it, it, it's nice, especially if you're uh, relatively young, but some people just can't uh, do away with that. They're, they're city people. Uh, we have the city mouse and the country mouse, if, if you will. I'm a country mouse. I commute about uh, 45 minutes and live up on uh, Lake Simcoe, if you know where that is. Uh, and I could not see uh, living in the city. Uh, I think the millennials are going to tell the tale, and that's true with sharing, the so-called sharing economy as well, that uh, millennials, uh, for the most part, have done away with cars and rely on Uber and Lyft and such things. Uh, they've also uh, relied on uh, Airbnb and uh, couch surfing and uh, so forth when they do go uh, outside of the city. Uh, I think that uh, Airbnb has obviously really taken uh, a big beating, especially for property developers that uh, were managing a number of properties and have sort of leveraged uh, their, their income in, in doing that. Uh, and so changing patterns are going to make a big difference. Uh, building tourism back is going to be the lifeblood of uh, the inner city. It's still going to be populated, uh, but populated by a relatively greater proportion of tourists relative to, uh, depends on the city obviously, uh, but relative to uh, the local population. I do think people will uh, live farther out. If, if you're only going into the office every once every week, once every uh, two weeks, uh, an hour commute and probably going to be much less an hour with less traffic congestion, is much more tolerable. And so having that space, uh, having some greenery around you is a morale booster. Uh, and I think uh, people are going to uh, not wholesale leave the city, but I think it's going to change the um, domestic patterns. From Vishal Roy, who asks, do you expect major companies to rebrand themselves or reinvent themselves if the spend spending capacity of the consumer takes a hit? Yeah. Um, Imagine that you're a, a restaurant owner and you're trying to uh, promote that your restaurant is not only good food and good service, but uh, safe. Uh, how do you go about doing that? You may be emphasizing entirely different factors uh, than you did previously. Uh, products and services, uh, for that matter, that uh, can be done uh, safely, uh, maybe emphasizing different things. Uh, our, our bank is not only secure in terms of keeping your money safe, but it keeps your physical body uh, safe as well. Uh, our uh, provision of uh, cleaning, uh, household cleaning. Uh, we uh, inspect our cleaners, uh, Molly maids, things of that sort. Uh, daily, we do temperature taking, we do uh, COVID testing, uh, so that when they come to your house, they're not bringing any virus uh, with them. And so um, that's rebranding that service again is not just offering uh, cleaning of the home, but cleaning uh, of the people. And we think of uh, viruses and, and germs as having to do with uh, dirt and a lack of safety. 
So those are just a few examples, but uh, yes, I think many brands will try to rebrand themselves in terms of what they're emphasizing in their promotions. The next question is from Aaron Shi. Uh, and the question is, would this pandemic tend to lead some companies to narrow their, their international scope of markets, to relocate their resources from certain countries to other ones, or to do the opposite to lower the future risk? Yeah, I think uh, we had a talk earlier on of, uh, on supply chain management. And uh, if you're a company that uh, has had your supply chain compromised or, or cut off uh, because of uh, changes due to pandemic, uh, you want to hedge your bets and you want to have a more flexible supply chain. You want to have all alternatives. It's hard to turn on a dime uh, and do that. So it's hard for a company like Apple uh, to move all of its production out of Foxcom into uh, other industries, although they obviously do some of that uh, right now. Uh, and so having a, a, a more diverse uh, supply chain, even though it may be somewhat less efficient in some cases, may be a safer bet. Uh, it depends on future probabilities that uh, we've already been through more than one once in a century uh, catastrophes recently. And so I think uh, those contingencies are going to uh, look for even small probabilities and uh, trying to uh, ensure against them. In terms of distribution, I think companies are going to want their global distribution back as quickly as, uh, as they can get it. Uh, Apple and others uh, relied really heavily on uh, China. Uh, Netflix uh, has not taken uh, a beating in terms of distribution because uh, they're, they're able to distribute their product uh, internationally just as easily. Uh, they had to cut back on resolution because they were worried that they were going to overwhelm the internet with people downloading movies and, and television. Uh, but they kept on um, promoting themselves uh, with lots of new offerings and new series uh, and, and so forth. Uh, so it depends upon the industry that you're in. But I think everyone is going to want to go global again in terms of distribution, maybe a little bit more local uh, supply chains as a, a safety valve, but uh, again, more diversity. We are running out of time. So this is the last question. This is from Carolina Davison. Uh, are consumers concerned that the governments around the world are just increasingly attempting to exercise control over their lives under the reason of COVID-19? via apps, cameras, and other means of tracking. Is privacy liber liberty ever an increasing concern from the standpoint of consumers? I think consumers should be concerned about this. Uh, we still haven't uh, given back in the US, and I'm still a US citizen, um, the, uh, the giving away of privacy that we did uh, in uh, various legislation after the 9-11 uh, attacks. So, uh, if that's any indication, I think governments are going to be um, unlikely to want to give back um, the, these uh, rights to privacy and other things, uh, at least immediately. Uh, we have to worry not just about governments, but about corporations. Remember I said that uh, Google and Apple were teaming up to provide tracking capabilities uh, in the US and North America and perhaps elsewhere. Uh, and so we need to worry about what those companies are going to be doing. Uh, with and Facebook and others as well, uh, with the information that they're, they're getting. And uh, we, we've been concerned uh, with, with government, but I think we need to be concerned with corporations as well uh, and be you know, vigilant in protecting our liberties. The possibility uh, of changes in work, changes in commuting, changes in the role of the automobile, changes in shopping patterns. Uh, actually, there's a talk uh, coming up on where we live, where we shop, uh, and where we work, uh, which I think could be very interesting. Changes in entertainment. Uh, a lot of us have new subscriptions now. Changes in where we live and work, as I said. Uh, opportunities to seriously consider and address climate change. We've seen how dramatically we can impact it by uh, just staying home, or at least many of us staying at home. Opportunities to improve health care for all, uh, especially in the U.S. Opportunities to address the worsening income inequalities, which uh, in times of crises, it's, it's the uh, ideal opportunity. And uh, if we get uh, a new U.S. government uh, in, I think it's going to be likely that we will work on these problems. And finally, opportunities as well as threats, which vary depending upon the generation that you're in, your job, your income, your location and intersectionality, uh, which is looking at more than one factor at a time. So it's not just the fact that you're a woman, but you're a woman of color in a particular socioeconomic class in a particular region uh, of the world, 
all of those things uh, affect uh, how you've been impacted and what you can expect uh, in the future. So I think I'll leave it there and uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, Russ. Uh, that was a very absorbing uh, presentation. And on behalf of uh, full audience, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time. Uh, so now we want to uh, end on a couple of notes. Uh, one is I want to talk, uh, mention our seminar that is coming up next week. And that's related to one of the last few questions that Russ had uh, uh, answered. Uh, and that is, have we reached the peak of globalization? And what are the implications for international business, cross-border trade, and so on. So we will have Professor Anup Madhok, Professor of Strategy and Scotia Bank Chair in International Business and Entrepreneurship, talking about that topic. And finally, uh, I want to reiterate that uh, if you have any questions about the seminars, about your admission process, about uh, anything related to your education at Shulik, we are open for business. You can con connect us through all these uh, uh, websites, as well as uh, the various social, social media um, handles. Uh, so thanks again, and I look forward to seeing um, all of, uh, or most of you next week. Thank you.